three, two, one. All right, welcome to a pre recorded lecture uh, taking place for Tuesday class, talking about uh, the terminant which we set up on Monday and outlined um, how we're going to approach this. As we noted, um, the determinant is a very useful tool in mathematics, but it basically its actual definition is like trash um, in terms of its recursive formula and also in terms of uh, what's known as the permutation formula uh, which I didn't give you but you can look up I mean like I said it requires some knowledge of 301 to even like begin understanding what it's actually communicating to you um, but anyway so our approach is gonna be very different um, than what the book does um, and this is an approach I found in uh, a book called Linear Algebra, written by somebody named Kenneth Hoffman, um, and once I found this, I was like, oh, this, why, why isn't this how we always teach determinants? And we'll see as we go, it's, I mean, there's no good way of approaching determinants, unfortunately, um, so much so that um, there's a very famous Linear Algebra book uh, called Linear Algebra Done Right by a guy named Sheldon Axler, and he outright does not even include determinants. Um, that makes his whole computing eigenvalues, which is what we're going to primarily use determinants for um, uh, after we get back from break. Um, his approach to eigenvalues ends up being really weird, um, but anyway. So, yeah. All right, so what's going to be our approach? Well, our approach is going to be um, that we're going to just announce that there is a function that takes matrices in as input and spits out a real number. Um, and the function has three properties, alternating, row linear, and uh, identity preserving. Okay, and all right, what are those three things mean? Got my, let's see, it's Olivia. Olivia is supposed to be sleeping and I just heard a noise. So, oh no, let's see how far I can go. Okay, so uh, they're basically, uh, determinants exist and they have three properties. All right, the first one, uh, alternating, uh, means that if you have a matrix with two rows that are identical, then zero. Don't care what that is equal to. Okay, all right, the next property is that um, the determinant is linear with respect to the rows. And like I said, this is the clunky part. Because um, it takes a little bit to get used to what this is saying, but basically it's saying that the determinant is linear if there is uh, a trio of matrices where in one row we have a linear combination, and then in all of the other rows everything is set equal. So we did an example of this in class and wanted to see kind of what we mean and how this works. Um, uh, so like I said, um, elsewhere. This is also known as n linear to indicate that there are n things that it is linear on. It's a weird name. Uh, I like real linear better. Um, all right, and the third property is that it's identity preserving, meaning that uh, the determinant of the identity is equal to one. Okay, so uh, we already announced the determinant of a two by two matrix is AD minus BC, and you can verify that all three of these properties um, are true for that. And if you're an absolute um, mad individual, you can verify all three of these hold for the formula for three by three that I gave you. But anyway, okay. So uh, let's start unpacking how all of this stuff works, and primarily let's start getting used to how this works, because this ends up being like the key property, um, the thing that really makes determinants determinants. These other things are just sort of like regularity conditions to ensure that uh, the determinant is unique. Uh, it turns out it's pretty easy to create growth linear mappings, but um, we want a unique function, and you, know, you need these things to basically make everything smooth out. But all right, so let's get started uh, to get used to the row linear part of it, okay? So the first thing we're going to prove is that if you've got a matrix where one row is identically zero, so that's what this is announcing, then the determinant is equal to zero. And that should make sense because, again, the determinant is supposed to be the magic number that detects invertibility. Specifically, a matrix is invertible precisely when its determinant is non-zero, which we're going to prove in a little bit. Um, but right, so this result should be true. Right, because if a matrix has a row that is identically zero, it has no hope of being invertible because its rank is not going to be full. 
All right, so let's actually see the proof of this, since it gives us, again, kind of a flavor of how row linearity works, and getting used to these proofs that we're about to do. All right, so the first thing to note is that this matrix, A, uh, there is a linear combination happening, and it's j row, right? Specifically, it's j row is equal to itself plus itself. Linear combo. All right, and then every other row is help fix. So because determinants are row linear, that means that when I look at the determinant of A, since there's a linear combo occurring in precisely one row, then I know that the determinant of A will be the determinant of A plus the determinant of A. And the only real number that does this, of course, is zero. All right, cool. And there's a, a crying baby, as promised. All right. Okay, so um, as a corollary to this, or a corollary, if we're pronouncing it correctly, um, the zero matrix has a determinant of zero. Obviously, every row of the zero matrix is zero, so we just get this for free, but again, it's worth stressing that this is true. Okay. All right. All right. Moving forward. All right, so... Row linearity should immediately make you think of row operations, fortunately or unfortunately, right? Since we are requiring the mapping to act linearly on rows, so in exactly one row there's a linear combo, and in every other row nothing is happening, you should venture to guess that all of the row operations then should be respected. And this is why you would even care about row linearity in the first place, because as we've already noted, row operations are like, you know, the bread and butter of matrix theory, of actually working with matrices. So a mapping that's linear with respect to the rows should, you, you would naturally eventually consider this. All right, so what we're going to prove um, in a series of three results is that the three row operations, um, so scaling a row, scaling and adding a row, and swapping two rows, the determinant of performing those operations is massively predictable, which, um, so as we noted, the formula for determinants is like, you know, a recursive nightmare to actually perform. But as we're going to see here, um, row operations do not affect determinants that much. So if you actually want a computer to determine it, there's a row operation trick you can pull, um, which I think is how computers actually compute it. Um, because as I noted, the determinant of a 10 by 10 would have 10 factorial operations, which you wouldn't ask a computer to do that. Um, but anyway, all right. So the first thing we're going to prove is that the type one row operation, so scaling a row, uh, the determinant of a matrix after you've scaled exactly one row, which again, we can represent as a matrix multiplication. And again, this is gonna be very important because one of the things that we're going to prove is the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. Um, so scaling a row is just going to scale the determinant accordingly. That's very nice. And again, um, this is very easy to prove uh, because what does it mean to scale a row? Well, one row is a scalar multiple and the other rows are held fixed. There is a linear combo occurring in one row. So by row linearity, the determinant acts linearly. So E times A, all right, I look at it and it says, all right, the P for row is scaled, the other rows aren't doing anything, so I'm going to just pull out that alpha because I act linearly on the rows. Cool. Hey, that's really nice. And um, as a corollary, of course, to this, if you scale every row by alpha, that's the same thing as scaling the matrix. And this says, all right, well, each row you pull out an alpha, and so we're going to pull out N of them, and so we get alpha to the N. So again, determinants aren't linear themselves. They are row linear. So because of that, uh, when you try to pull out the alpha, you don't get alpha, you get alpha to the n. Um, so for those of you that like the deep lore, um, this is saying specifically that determinants are um, n homogeneous. So you don't pull out alpha, you pull out alpha to the n. Um, and those are studied. Um, you may or may not have encountered them in Diffie Q if you're interested. All right, moving right along. Okay, so our next uh, goal is to go after the type two row operation, scaling a row and adding it to another. And now note that it is literally creating a linear combo in one row. So, mm -hmm. uh, but before we get there, we gotta prove a result that we're gonna use, um, which is a modification of the uh, alternating property. 
Um, and that is that if we have a matrix where one row is a scalar multiple of another, then the determinant should equal zero. And again, that shouldn't be shocking because any matrix with this property cannot have full rank in its reduced row echelon matrix form. Uh, performing the row operations, you're going to delete an entire row. So rank can't be full, can't be invertible, determinant should be zero. All right, so let's set it up. Okay, so what are we going to use here? Well, we're going to use uh, the fact that scaling a matrix, taking its determinant, uh, scaling a row of a matrix, taking its determinant means you just plot the scalar, and we're going to use the alternating property, which means if I have a matrix where two rows are uh, identical, then the determinant is zero. So we're going to set up this auxiliary matrix, and this is going to be a technique you're going to see uh, repeatedly here in these proofs we're going to do, where we set up this other matrix and then apply the determinant and then use all the key properties to get what we want. So we'll set up this auxiliary matrix B, where its P for O is Q, and its K for O is everything else. So now we're letting the P for O be the Q for O, which is the row in the matrix where we got the scalar multiple going on. Okay, so obviously we're going to set up a matrix where the P and Q rows align up, and then the alternating this gives us zero. Okay, so no, like I just said, this matrix P, uh, B, its P for O is AQ, but uh, by its construction, its Q for O is also P. Okay, so that means the P for O and the Q for O of B is identical, and by the alternating property, that means this matrix is the determinant is zero. All right, now what else do we know about the matrix uh, B? Uh, the P for O of A is the uh, Q for O of A times alpha, and by construction that is alpha times um, the P for O of B. So the P for O of A lines up with a scalar multiple of the P for O of B, and by construction all of the other rows of B are equal to the rows of A, so in exactly one row, a linear combination is occurring, every other row is held fixed. So the determinant of A then will be this scalar multiple of the determinant of B, but we set up B so that the alternateness guaranteed that it was equal to zero. And there we go, the determinant is zero, beautiful. Okay, so this is um, a very thematic proof. Uh, proof that uh, uh, you're going to see repeatedly with the determinant, where you set up this other matrix, you use the alternatingness um, of, the of the determinant on that matrix, and then the other uh, row linearity properties kick in and everything cleans up. Um, and in fact, when we prove um, that type threes swapping two rows, you'll see it's really it's a real slick proof. It's about you set up a bunch of stuff and then everything magically cleans up in the end. Uh, but before we get there, let's attack type two. And now this right here um, uh, is, in my opinion, probably one of the most counterintuitive results in this course, and probably all of mathematics. And uh, that's the following. So let E be the type two elementary matrix of rows P and Q and alpha. So we're going to um, scale the P row by alpha and add it to the Q row. So the type two row operation, which is the one that does the most damage to your matrix, right? This is the raw operation that introduces zeros, that deletes terms, right? So you would imagine that um, such a catastrophic change to your matrix should like obliterate the determinant. It should make the determinant just go nuts. But as you can see, scaling a row and adding it to another does not change the determinant, which if we just think about the formulas um, for the determinant of the three by three, in fact, like look at that formula and then scale a row and add it to another, that should completely ruin it, but it somehow doesn't. And right, like I said, if I gave you the recursive formula and asked you to prove this, right, where to even begin? And then second of all, why would you even think it was true, right? It seems like that should completely mess up um, uh, what the determinant evaluates as. But this other approach, with the row linear, you quickly see why it actually um, works out this way. Okay, so let's set up the beginning of the proof. So again, um, first uh, we begin with an auxiliary matrix. We set up another matrix that looks like A, but not really. Um, so specifically, the Q row of B is the P row of A scaled by alpha, and all other rows are held fixed. So linear combo occurring in one row, and other rows are held fixed. Now, if we look at the Q row of EA, 
So again, remember uh, the type 2 operation scales the PIF row and adds it to the QF row. What's this again? That's the QF row of B. So this, is, this thing's QF row is actually a linear combo of A and B. And all of its other rows are held fixed. So in exactly one row, there is a linear combination occurring. Note the rows line up here. If this was a P and that was a Q, we could not make this following conclusion here. But they line up, so by rollinearity, this splits up into a sum. But what do we know about the matrix B? Well, we know that one of its rows, by design, is a scalar multiple of another. So this zeroes out. Hooray! So that goes away, and then we get that the determinant of a matrix after scaling a row and adding it to another does not change its determinant. So, like I said, this is a staggering result to me. Because it really feels like scaling your own adding it to another should absolutely ruin your determinant based on the formulas that we've already seen. But, surprisingly, it doesn't. And now you see this proof here, it's really clear why it doesn't ruin anything. Because of the row linearity. Right, because when we look at scaling a matrix, uh, taking a matrix and scaling a row and adding it to another, Right, you're just making a linear combo in one row and you're holding all of the other rows fixed. So again, you would naturally think about a mapping that respects linear combos in rows. So, probably one of the reasons why determinants became a thing. All right, cool, beautiful. All right, so type twos are taken care of, type ones are taken care of, so now we set our sights on the last one, which is type three. So again, remember this is you take the rows P and Q and swap them. Okay, so when we first started talking about row operations, I noted, um, and it was, as somebody pointed out, as Ashlyn po pointed out, um, it seems like this is like a meaningless move. Um, like, it's almost cosmetic, because the scaling of a row obviously can um, get me ones, which I like, and scaling and adding a row creates zeros, which, again, we like, because we want to make as many zeros as possible. Um, swapping rows doesn't seem like it really does anything um, other than just make the equations look nicer. But, as I noted, um, they're going to be, uh, back then, I noted that they're going to be a big deal once we get to determinants, and here's why. Swapping two rows negates the determinant. So, of the three row operations that we have, scaling scales the determinant, scaling and adding does nothing, and swapping negates it. So, all of our row operations don't affect our determinant that much. That's very beautiful. <laughs> and it's going to be the key ingredient to proving that the determinant is zero precisely when the matrix is not invertible. All right. So. Let's go on. Okay, so now this proof, um, like I said, uh, is going to be uh, kind of a cool proof. Because basically we're just going to set up, um, uh, if I remember right, we're going to set up five separate matrices. And then we're going to smash them all together. And then this result's just going to pop out for free. Uh, which is always a good time. So here in the beginning, we're going to just set up a bunch of matrices, and at first glance, it's going to be, okay, what is, the why are we doing this? Um, so bear with me. Hold on. It's all going to work out. Okay, so the first matrix we're going to set up is going to have a linear combo in two of its rows. It's going to have in its P for row, um, A, P, uh, the, the P for O of A plus the Q for O of A, and that'll be in both the P for O and the Q for O, and every other row we'll just hold fixed. So note that um, two of B's rows are identical, so its determinant must equal zero. All right, so again, we've already seen this kind of happen in a proof. We're, we are going to set up these auxiliary matrices um, where uh, the determinant of them is obviously zero, so when the row linearity kicks in, it just disappears. Okay, so now we're going to set up two more matrices. All right, um, so the first one is going to have that same uh, linear combo of the row of the P for O and the Q for O of A in the P spot um, uh, <laughs> and held fixed everywhere else. Then the matrix D will also have uh, that linear combo, but in the Q for O, we're going to sneak in AP. And Okay, you, again, you look at this and go, all right, where, where, where are you going with this, bro? All right, yeah, we're going to get there. Okay, now let's see how all of these matrices relate to each other and how the row linearity is going to kick in and help us. Okay, so the Q for O of B, remember, is this linear combo. Okay, 
Now, uh, the Q-Fro of uh, A lines up with the Q-Fro of C. Note, right there, because K is not equal to P. All right, and the P-Fro of A we designed to set up with the Q-Fro of D. So the Q-Fro of B has this linear combo of the Q-Fro's of D and C happening. The P-Fro of B is this linear combo, which by construction we made sure lined up with the P-Fro of C and the P-Fro of D. And then any other row you can think of, um, everything just lines up. Um, so what's going on with the matrix B? In precisely one row, there's a linear combo. Oops. And I get out of here, Outlook. Um, and in every other row, everything's identical, so that means the row linearity kicks in, and the determinant of B is the determinant of D plus the determinant of C. But the determinant of B, we rigged to be equal to zero. So, ooh, hey, I've got a summation of two things equaling zero. That means the determinant of D is negative, the determinant of C. And, oh yeah, look what I'm trying to prove. This thing right here. Yeah, I wonder if uh, we're going to show that these things line up with what we want them to. All right. So, uh, like I said, we're going to set up another matrix. <laughs> so let M be uh, the type 2 elementary matrix with the rows Q, P, and 1. So that means the P fro of uh, M times A has the Q fro being added to the P fro of A, which, note, hey, is the P fro of C. And then every other row is held fixed, which, hey, is equal to the k row of C. So the matrix C that we set up was actually just m times a um, in disguise. So, uh, yeah, I snuck that in. Deal with it. Uh, and um, so uh, the determinant of C is then the, oh, what happened there? That should be a determinant. Whatever. Pretend that says determinant. Uh, the determinant of m times a, which, um, because as we just demonstrated, type 2 elementary matrices, do not change the value of the determinant, so the determinant of A lines up with the determinant of C. Beautiful. And then similarly, uh, the determinant of D, if we uh, work for all the details here, will equal M uh, times Z times A, and uh, yeah, again, snuck that in. All right, and what happens there? Well, again, this is a type 2, so the type 2 doesn't care about the value of the determinant, so we find the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of E times A. Okay, and there we go. The proof is over. So, pretty sneaky. Right. And uh, so again, remember, um, E times A is swapping the rows. Uh, so if you're wondering where the row swap happened, it is occurring exactly right here. There you go. And there you go. Beautiful. So there we go. Uh, all three of our row operations do not do any serious damage to our determinants. So if we combine all these results together into a single proposition, we've got this result. If you've got a matrix A and a row operation, performing the row operation gives you a non-zero scalar multiple of the determinant of the original. And this is easy to see because of all of our three uh, row operations, um, type 1s are going to just spit out a non-zero scalar. So again, remember, type 1s are only allowed to scale by non-zero. Scaling by zero would delete a row, which we don't want. Type 2s don't do anything, so we just scale by 1. And type 3s scale by negative 1. So choose that. And note, this means by repeated applications of this, if you've got two matrices that are row equivalent, the determinant of A will just line up with some non-zero scalar multiple of the determinant of B. So, if you take a matrix, get it in reduced row echelon form, you keep track of the scalar, and as we are going to now demonstrate, uh, one of two things happen. You're equivalent to the identity, or you're not. And if you're not equivalent to the identity, you got a big fat row of zeros. So, combining all of this now together reveals the key fact for determinants, which is that uh, your matrix is invertible precisely if the determinant is non-zero. And the trick here is the usual trick that we've pulled for invertible matrices. Being invertible means you are row equivalent to the identity. So since the determinant of the identity is equal to 1, and by the previous uh, corollary, uh, we know that the determinant of A is some scalar multiple of the determinant of I. This scalar is not negative, so if you're invertible, your determinant must be non-zero. 
All right, and conversely, if you're not invertible, then the matrix um, that you're equivalent to in row echelon form must have a row equal to zero. If it does not have a row equal to zero, then all of its rows are non-zero, so its rank must be full, but that would mean it's invertible. So one of the rows, specifically we know the last one, has to be zero, but as we proved, any matrix with a uh, row identically equal to zero has a determinant equal to zero. And since A is row equivalent to E, its determinant must be a scalar multiple of the determinant of E, but the determinant of E is zero, so the debt is zero. So here you go. The key fact of determinants, their ability to check invertibility. Um, now easily proven. Beautiful. And again, have fun trying to prove this from the recursive formula or directly from the uh, permutation formula. But for us, not too bad of a proof. Beautiful. All right. So now that we're equipped with this, um, we have two other key facts for determinants we're now going to easily dispatch of. First of all, the determinant is uh, multiplicative, meaning that the determinant of A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. So first we'll do it where we're multiplying by a elementary matrix. And again, as we've already noted, multiplying by an elementary matrix is very predictable. All right, so the determinant of E times A here, since it's type one, means it's scaling by alpha. But what's the determinant of I equal to? One. The identity matrix you can then sneak in here because I'm multiplying by one. And hey, a scalar multiple of the determinant is the same thing as performing the row operation. But I'm multiplying by i, so you just get that of e. And, oh, dirtiest trick in the math book. Multiply by 1. Just be really smart about how you choose 1. All right, and then for type 2 and type 3, the argument goes exactly the same. Uh, again, multiplying by the identity doesn't change anything. So, again, dirty math trick. Multiply by 1 and sneak it in. All right, so now that we know that um, multiplying by an elementary matrix... Let's us pull the determinants apart, we can then extend this to proving that the determinant of a product is indeed the product of the determinants. So the first thing to note is that if A is not invertible, then A times B couldn't be invertible. Um, if A times B was invertible, then I can multiply on the right and get it equal to the identity, which means A would have a right, in, which means A would have a right inverse, but as we've proved for square matrices, that means it has to be invertible, but that can't happen. So since A is not invertible, its product's not invertible, so the determinant of A times B is zero. The determinant of A is also equal to zero, so I'm sneaking in a multiply by zero trick now. And you see that debt of A times B lines up with debt of A times debt of B. So for the invertible case, um, now we'll recall that elementary matrices, um, again, they act kind of like the prime numbers, and that every invertible matrix is a product of these things, the same way that every integer is a product of primes. Now, if you apply the determinant to A times B, well, B is being multiplied by all these elementary matrices, but as we just proved, if you take debt of those products, you can just start pulling debts apart. So you can pull apart all of the debts, and then you can reapply that by reconstituting all of these, and then you'll just get the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Beautiful. Slick proof. I always like this proof. The first time I saw this one, I was like, oh, this, this, is, this is neat. Oh, cool. All right. Well, um, as I've repeatedly said, when the math gods let us prove something, they want us to use it. So let's use it. So specifically, this now reveals um, an interesting property of determinants. Um, if you've got an invertible matrix, you have access to its inverse. Its determinant of its inverse does what you want it to do which is one over it, right? Because again, if you're looking at this, you want to do one over. All right, and it's pretty easy to see because again, we've rigged the determinant to have the determinant of the identity equal one. The determinant's multiplicative, so these pull apart, and then you just divide over. Now, since you're invertible, you know this is non-zero, so one over it is fine. All right, so uh, we have now proven that the determinant is multiplicative. We determine, uh, we've proven that the determinant of a matrix is zero, precisely when it's not invertible. The last thing we're going to go after is transposition. So the determinant of a transpose turns out to equal the determinant of the original. So again, this proof is going to follow exactly the same as the previous one, where we did a product of elementary matrices. So let's talk about the determinant of a transpose of an elementary matrix. 
Now, um, if you're a type one, that means you've scaled a row, and that means if you take the transpose, nothing happens. So it's the same matrix that determinants line up. If you're a type two, that means you scale a row and add it to another. Now remember, you're scaling the uh, identity matrix, um, you're scaling a row of the identity matrix and adding it to another. And so if you transpose it, um, it's going to give you now a type two, only now um, the row you added to is the row you scale and add to the row uh, that you scaled originally. So if you take a, a type two matrix and look at its transpose, you'll also get a type two. Um, but note that the determinant of a type 2 is just going to equal 1 because performing a type 2 does not change the determinant of the matrix. So just performing a type 2 um, on its own here is just doing that to the identity matrix, whose determinant is 1. So these determinants line up, and likewise for a type 3, if you swap two rows, take a transpose, well, they're still swapping the same two rows. So there you go. It's uh, symmetric. All right, and so there we see the debt of those lines up as well. Beautiful. All right, and let's wrap things up now by using this with the multiplicative property of determinants to prove that the determinant of a transpose is just the determinant of the original. All right, and so again, we pull the same trick. If A is not invertible, then its transpose can't be invertible. And we prove that. If the matrix its transpose is invertible, uh, then the matrix is invertible. Um, Right where, remember, the uh, inverse of a transpose is the transpose of the inverse. So if A is not invertible, then neither is its trans, uh, transpose. So those determinants are just zero, so they just equal each other. All right, and if A is invertible, then again, we can write it as a product of elementary matrices. But as we just demonstrated, um, the determinant of the transpose of an elementary matrix is the determinant of the original. So uh, this is a product, determinant's multiplicative, so it pulls the products apart. Transpose of an elementary matrix does not change the determinant. So then we uh, reorder them, and now note here, these are real numbers, so I can reorder the multiplication. Now if they're matrices, I couldn't reorder them, but I turned them in the real numbers, so now I can reorder them. So that's worth stressing here that when you take the transpose, that will reverse the order of the multiplication. But here, haha, these are real numbers, I can swap the order. All right, and then so the determinant of this product is the determinant of A, and there we go. Beautiful. All right, there we go. So uh, we've now uh, gotten our whistle wet here. When it comes to uh, working with determinants, so working with the real linearity, the alternating, and the fact that the identity matrix goes to 1. All right, so we've proven now quite a few key properties, uh, so what's next? All right, so um, when we set things up with determinants, we said, okay, for any matrix A, there is a matrix B, so that A times B is a scalar multiple of the identity. So we've set up what the scalar is, it's the determinant. So now how do you get to the matrix B? So that matrix is called the adjugate, and in order to get to it, well, we now need to talk a little bit more about the recursive formula, specifically R8, where that formula come from, and how does it relate to all of this alternating row linear identity preserving stuff. And that will be what we'll do on Thursday. So, all right. So Thursday we'll do that, and then on Friday we will set up what the adjugate is, and prove that A times the adjugate is the determinant times the identity, thus giving us the formula for the inverse of any n by n matrix. Beautiful. All right, so that is uh, the plan. That's the end of the video. I hope you liked it. See you next time.